thank you all for coming. And um, I'm Brinton Likes, and I am, along with Nan Kanstrom, the Associate Director of the Center for Human Rights and International Justice, which is hosting this evening. And um, we're delighted to have you here to invite you into conversation about two books, one of which is published and available on the um, side table over there after the presentation, and the other of which is about to be published in the next day or two. One of these books looks a lot better than the <laughs> cover art is not. And it is, it is available at the same discount if you <laughs> fill out a little piece of paper that's on the table on the cover back there. But most of all, we're happy to have this opportunity to share with each other our reflections on each of our own books and on each other's books in a, a conversation and dialogue and invite you into that conversation. So the format for this evening is we'll begin by introducing ourselves and then um, Dr. Johnson will show us some slides about her book and Professor Canstrom and I will talk some about our book and then we will talk to each other for a few minutes about each other's books, questions that we've raised. One of the um, commitments we made to each other was to read each other's books before we showed up tonight. So I'm delighted that I had the opportunity to have a deadline to finish this <laughs> book. Um, so I, in addition to working at the Center for Human Rights, I'm also a professor of community and cultural psychology here at Boston College. And I've worked for many years in uh, Latin America in context of ongoing war and transitions from war, particularly in Guatemala with Mayan women and children, and more recently on transnational issues having to do with detention, deportation, and forced return to countries of origin. Uh, I'll defer. <laughs> Okay, I'm Lynn Johnson. I'm a member of the history department uh, here at Boston College. I've been here for a couple of decades now. Um, so this is um, uh, this latest book is continues my interest in urban U.S. urban and social history. Um, I have written uh, about migration before, uh, primarily about internal migration um, from the South and the Midwest to the West Coast during World War II. Um, and uh, in the New Bostonians, I'm looking uh, right here in my own backyard at the history of the new immigration since 1965 or the 1960s, roughly. And um, I also wrote another book about uh, called Street Justice, a History of Police Violence in New York City. Um, about 10 years ago, it's being read again all of a sudden, no <laughs> surprise. Um, but um, there, there been migration has been was also important in that book too because um, immigrants were very much targeted by police uh, violence um, from the 1970s uh, and 80s forward, uh, as well as earlier time time periods. So um, this sort of continues my interest in this subject. My name is Dan Kenstrom. I'm a professor at the law school. I teach uh, human rights law, immigration law, constitutional law, and administrative law, and I have taught criminal law in the past. And I founded our immigration and asylum clinic, and I directed our criminal clinic for some years. Um, my scholarship has focused in the last 10 years or so on the history and the nature and the contradictions of the deportation system of the United States. And, and the goal of my work has been to conceptualize deportation as a system, to understand it as a problem of law and policy and society that is actually different from questions of immigration, obviously related to them, but something that I think needs to be understood on its own terms as a system of majoritarian power that uses the idea of the citizen alien uh, divide as a tool of social control and as a tool of business control and has its own uh, rather shameful history the deeper you go into it. So I wrote a book called Deportation Nation that was published in 2007 that was this attempt to synthesize history and to, and to write about the, the idea that the United States is a nation of immigrants but is also a nation of deportation. That the, these things have always vied with each other in various ways. And then I started concentrating on what happens to people after they get deported. So I published a book called Aftermath deportation law and the new American diaspora that made an extended argument that the United States has created a diaspora population of 
former long-term residents who are culturally, linguistically, socially, existentially Americans, but who now live all over the world in the Dominican Republic, in the Azores, in Africa, and Haiti, and that this is a phenomenon that's worth studying and that needs to be understood through the lens of human rights law. And uh, in the last few couple of years, I've co-authored two books, one with a sociologist named Cecilia Menivar, that was an attempt to look at the idea of illegality from a number of different perspectives. And then this one with Professor Likes, that is an attempt, which I'll talk more about, to look at the system of deportation through the lens of how it actually works. And, and, and then we have chapters by people who have administered that system. So that's what I've been trying to do to keep myself out of trouble for the last few years. <laughs> I also have to apologize that I think I have the flu. I definitely have a cold. So I'm going to speak more quietly than I usually do, and probably less than I usually do. That's why we're here. <laughs> Is that the reason? <laughs> there are other reasons. Um, so yes, I will, we will now sit. And you're going to take the first degree. So 1965 always seems to be the starting place uh, for my topic. Um, this was when, and, and this is actually the 50th anniversary of this year of the 1965 Immigration Act, which I discovered uh, a lot of people in this country don't really know the history of it, how significant it is in the history of immigration. Uh, but many of you here probably do. And you see uh, President Lyndon Johnson signing the bill at the foot of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, this is a big deal. Uh, this bill had been a long time in the making. Um, and finally reversed um, the, the very biased and restrictive immigration system that had been put in place in the 1920s. Um, it, it, just to briefly sum up, it got rid, this new act got rid of the old uh, quota system, a discriminatory quota system, and instead gave equal quotas to countries across the globe and then raised the ceiling on the total number of immigrants who could enter the country um, annually. It also gave preferences to skilled workers as well as uh, exemptions for family members of US citizens, which allowed many um, highly skilled, uh, highly educated migrants on the one hand to come, as well as allowing established um, immigrant citizens uh, to bring their family members over. So in essence, it took an older practice of chain migration and actually um, sanctioned it and, and uh, extended it by, by making it part of, of uh, the Immigration Act. Within a couple of decades, this act transformed uh, our society. It cre made creating a remarkably diverse population, um, both in terms of race and ethnicity, but also in terms of skill and education levels and, and class. Um, and that was something that was not particularly expected. Uh, these legislators, uh, many of them here who, who worked on the bill, uh, were, sh sure to re were reassuring everyone that this would not really affect any kind of change in the immigrant population. Little did they know uh, it would affect a, a very big change. In Boston, the change was staggering. In the 1960s, um, it, Boston was a heavily white, Catholic, predominantly Irish-American town. Um, today, people of color make up uh, the majority of the city population, and in large part because of the immigration of people from Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and more recently, Africa. Um, Boston has always been uh, an important portal for immigration, um, but the diversity of our population um, today uh, is, 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 even in comparison to the peak years of the old immigration in the late 19th and early 20th century, has changed dramatically. And this is one of the illustrations in the book that um, I think Boston Magazine, uh, uh, Boston College Magazine actually picked it up and is going to publish a little article just around this. It is a very telling um, set of pie charts. You can see in 1910, there were basically four groups that made up more than three quarters of all the uh, foreign born in Boston. They were all from, all, these were all groups from Europe or Canada. Uh, if we look 100 years later, uh, under the 1965 regime, once it got going, um, you have this more than two dozen groups that make up the, the same uh, percentage. And they come from all over the world. Uh, European, there's a few European countries in there, but not many, and they have pretty small slices compared to all these other groups. And it's different from many other cities in the US also that have draw from a, a handful of countries um, on the, uh, Boston and New York and a few other cities on the East Coast have this remarkably diverse um, uh, composition uh, of the foreign born. So this immigration now is 50 years old. This obviously had a big impact. 
but, um, and we've had a lot of national studies of this phenomenon, but we don't know a lot about how immigrants have shaped American life in particular uh, places. Um, a lot of, there's been a lot of work by journalists and social scientists on this question, but not um, among historians so much. Um, we're still trying to, historians always take 20 or 30 years before they start making sense of things in the recent past. And that's why I wrote this book. I wanted to tell the story of um, uh, new immigrants in a particular city to see how that city evolved over time uh, as a result of immigration and how immigrants helped to shape that history. And Boston was really a great place to do that, as it turned out. Uh, it's a city that was uh, very much powered by immigrants in the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. And um, it's also been among the top immigrant receiving uh, cities of the post-1965 era. Um, and then at the same time, Boston also experienced an astounding um, economic and physical turnaround during these past 50 years. Um, and I, thinking back to my youth when I visited here, first visited Boston in the 1970s, it was a very down at the heel, older, uh, declining industrial center. Uh, and today, it's kind of the, one of the poster children of uh, the new knowledge economy. So what I wanted to know was, you know, what's the relationship between the new immigration and this larger urban uh, transformation? And as I argue in the New Bostonians, I think the two phenomena are uh, directly connected, um, and that immigration is very much a part of the bigger story behind the Boston Renaissance of uh, the last 30 or 40 years. Um, now, I don't want to oversimplify. There are many, many factors that went into the Boston uh, Renaissance, uh, glo the global restructuring of capital uh, being one of many uh, factors that uh, transformed life in the city. But I do believe that immigra immigration has been one of the, one of the key ingredients uh, of this transformation. And we can't really understand the recent history of the city unless we take the immigration uh, question seriously and understand, and this is true of the metro area as well, not just the city. Um, so without understanding that relationship, we, we're not going to fully know, understand the story. So I wanted to show you a couple more slides about um, some of the things that I think are most striking in this uh, relationship. One of them is the question of um, population replacement. Um, Boston's native-born population, as you can see, has been falling uh, since 19, since World War II, essentially, but since 1950 um, in the census data, Boston lost roughly 20% of its population uh, between 1950 and 1970. And the native-born uh, who stayed were in generally an older uh, aging population. However, since the 1980s, um, we have seen uh, the city's population uh, uh, go back up again, uh, primary, uh, along with the growth in its economy. And the growth in both the population and the economy has to do in pretty much entirely with immigrants. You can see a slight um, increase in the native-born population here. Most of that is due to the uh, birth of the second generation of foreign-born. So it's probably still declining or flat as far as the native-born population goes. And these are trends that are uh, in effect all over the country. Um, they're particularly pronounced here in New England. Um, some of our most important local industries, high tech, medicine, education, um, uh, and all the service fields that support them, employ a large and growing number of immigrants. And these include both um, higher end professionals, doctors, scientists, academics, uh, software engineers, but also the folks who uh, clean the buildings, who serve the food, who do yard work, who take care of our children and our elderly. Um, in short, you know, the economy just wouldn't function uh, without immigrants, and I think that's, you know, uh, that point was made a long time ago in Los Angeles when there was a day without immigrants, but it's uh, just as true here in Boston, if not more so, because immigrants are so important throughout uh, the economy <coughs> from top to bottom. Um, and just to show uh, the trends in the labor force, uh, you can see are very similar. It's all the growth in the economy has been uh, as a result of, of immigration. The native-born uh, population has remained pretty flat. Another way in which immigration has been really important is in terms of neighborhood and community revitalization. Um, and uh, this is, uh, immigrants have helped to reshape the city and the metro area. 
Um, the earnings of immigrants have been invested in, uh, in homes, in small businesses, and in tax dollars locally that have helped to revitalize um, urban neighborhoods and inner ring suburbs as well. So this is a metropolitan-wide phenomenon. And um, this was true in older city districts like Chinatown in the South End back in the 60s and 70s. Um, but it's it been even more important in some outlying neighborhoods like East Boston and Dorchester, just to name a couple, um, and also in entering uh, older industrial suburbs where older white ethnic groups were increasingly moving out um, in the 1970s and 80s as local manufacturing industries were closing down. And it was immigrants who came in, uh, bought homes, moved into old triple-deckers in these neighborhoods, um, opened businesses, and really revitalized these neighborhoods and, and provided a new vitality on the streets that often um, made these communities uh, safer as well as more, more prosperous. And that's something that I think um, it's pretty much the exact opposite of what people like Donald Trump have been saying recently, um, talking about immigrants as criminals and all this kind of stuff. Um, one example about revitalization, oh, here's just a, a quick uh, map comparing immigrants, and it's really blurry, I'm sorry, but um, you can see that the, the difference between you know, the light shading just around the city of Boston itself in 1970, which was mostly older immigrants at that point from the uh, previous waves of immigration, and this um, much more diffuse pattern of immigrant settlement um, in greater Boston in, in 2010, even going out to as far as places like Framingham and Acton. Um, but in terms of um, neighborhood uh, revital revitalization, I just wanted to show you these two images up here. For those of you who are my age or older, you may remember uh, what the Washington Street Corridor in Chinatown uh, looked like. It used to be known as the Combat District. It was mostly uh, porn theaters and uh, adult bookstores. Had a lot of prostitution and crime. Uh, was not, uh, was not the, uh, a, a garden spot of the city. And uh, in the 1980s, you had uh, uh, Chinese immigrants, primarily fleeing uh, ethnic Chinese from Vietnam, who were coming in. Um, taking over boarded up storefronts on Washington Street, starting small businesses and restaurants. And uh, today, uh, this is what Washington Street looks like. It's a central artery in Chinatown, now has a lot of luxury housing and uh, is being rapidly gentrified. Um, but uh, the whole process would not, um, of, of moving away from, from that, that city uh, scene would not have happened uh, without immigrants coming in and uh, investing in very small ways and turning the neighborhood around. And you can find this in you know, neighborhoods and, and inter entering suburbs um, across the region. So um, all is not rosy in this account. Um, mostly I'm telling a positive story because I think it's pretty, um, it, it's pretty obvious that it's been a positive story. But for all the good that immigrants have done for Boston, there have been conflicts and dislocations, uh, persistent discrimination and inequality that we have to recognize as well. As in the past, um, dis um, uh, recent immigrants have faced nativism and racism, especially immigrants of color um, who now make up the majority. And I look at the history of this phenomenon as well as the uh, more recent climate of repression and deportation that's taken hold since the 1990s and 9-11, um, which Dan and Brenton are going to be talking about in much more detail. Um, another big problem that we, we face and that immigrants face is that the, fruit of the, the fruits of the new Boston economy that immigrants have helped to build um, have not been equally shared. Yes, there are some newcomers who have done, who have well-paying jobs, who live in nice homes in the suburbs, who have, are well integrated into their communities, but there are many, many others who continue to struggle. Growing income inequality, patterns of contingent labor, entrenched forms of racism and segregation, uh, a lack of affordable housing, and uh, the growing costs of higher education have made it more difficult for immigrants to help their children to advance up the occupational ladder as older uh, groups did. Um, I really I make a plea in, in the end of the book uh, that we really begin to uh, would continue to deal with these problems, especially as people like me, the baby boom generation, will be retiring in big numbers in the next 10 to 15 years. 
um, we are going to need immigrants and their children uh, to replace these um, lost workers and residents, and they'll need the education and skills necessary um, to work in this new economy that um, we have here in Boston. So I will uh, end it there. There are many other things I talk about in the book, religion and politics, but we can talk about that later. Thanks. And it calls on us to ask critical questions about what has really been going on here. 
And I think part of what's been going on here has been a sort of proud continuation of the American mythology, the American national ideal of being a nation of immigrants, of, of being welcoming and, uh, and having welcoming poor and tired or huddled masses yearning to breathe free, you know, and all of that. Although I do tell my students in immigration law that if you want to understand the way immigration policy really works, take the inscription on the base of the Statue of Liberty and then just presume the opposite. Because if you're poor, you do not get to immigrate to the United States. If you're tired and you can't work, you cannot immigrate to the United States. If you're huddled masses yearning to breathe free and therefore socialist or communist, you will not be allowed to immigrate to the United States, et cetera, et cetera. So the realities of US immigration policy have been more complicated. So our book um, approaches questions like this inductively and empirically. And we try to explain through uh, chapters that are authored by immigration judges, by the person who ran detention programs for the Department of Homeland Security from law professors, and, and as Brinson will describe, through uh, empirical research, how deportation actually works and the effect that it's had on individuals, children, families, and communities. Um, I just want to finish by, by saying uh, something about the name of our book, which is The New Deportations Delirium. And I have colleagues who've been mocking me for this for a week now. You know, delirium, oh, I'm delirious, I'm so happy. But <laughs> we didn't actually make this term up. As some of you may know, many of you may not, so I will tell you that um, the, the term deportations delirium uh, was taken from a book that was written by Lewis Post, who was the uh, former US commissioner of deportation um, during the time known as the um, time of the Palmer raids in this country, which is roughly 1919 and 1920. And um, he was describing that period when there were massive abuses. And this was a, a period of time, actually, when um, Emma Goldman was deported, which is an interesting story for many reasons, not the least of which, that she was a US citizen. So actually, she was first secretly denaturalized and then deported. Um, but anyway, he referred to that as a deportation delirium. And the book is kind of famous. I actually have a first edition of it, which is uh, one of my prouder um, collections. Um, but I thought one of the ways to measure how we are doing as a nation state, how we can reconcile this contradiction, is to just measure the ratio of deportations to lawful admissions. So let me just tell you the, um, this is a, you know, not a perfect measure, but I think it's, it's interesting. Um, so according to government statistics, in 1920, the total number of US deportations was 14,577. Now that seems like a big number, but not, it's not big at all compared to what we're doing now. Immigrant admissions totaled 430,000. So the ratio of deportees to immigrants was about three to 100. So we deported approximately three people for every 100 who we admitted. So where are we today? From 1997, which was the year in which deportation laws changed dramatically after this rise in deportation. And by the way, the rise in deportation, if you do it, I keep doing this because the chart, it goes up like this starting around the mid-1980s. What, what else goes up like that is the, the incarceration statistics of young African-American men and other young men of color and felony disenfranchisement, which is actually taking the vote away from people who are convicted of crimes, which again, mostly young men of color. Anyway. From 1997 to 2012, the United States admitted about 15.5 million legal permanent residents. This is a very large number, and I think we should be proud of it. And, and as you heard, it's had very positive effects in cities like Boston, particularly in Boston. However, during that same period, total removals and returns exceeded 19.7 million. So the ratio was 127 to 100. That is to say, we went from 3 to 100 to 127 to 100. And I can tell you more about these numbers, but what, what we have tried to do and what I've done in much of my work is look at the effects of this part of the system as well. So I think it's a contradiction. I think it's a, it's a problem worth exploring, and that's what our book tries to do. And I hope that that's what our conversation may get us to some understanding of what's really going on. Five year period? I'm sorry? It's a five year period? Uh, no, not, it was a um, 15 year period. What was the number of illegal immigrants during that same period? Well, um, I don't know per year because nobody can measure the per year. Also, I 
I will assume from your question, but maybe I'm wrong, and tell me if I'm wrong, that what you're asking is how many people without documents entered the United States across various borders. The reason I ask that is that recent estimates have said that about 40% of the so-called illegal immigrants, which is not a term of art particularly, um, but it would mean somebody without status, have been people who have overstayed visas that they were granted. So the total undocumented population as of 2012 was probably about 11 or 12 million people, um, of whom probably 30 or 40 percent may have been overstays. Um, I'm just saying, should, should, the, should, the, should the deportation of, of, of immigrants be related more to the illegal, the illegal uh, flow in than the, than, the, than the legal amount of new? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is defer. Let's continue the presentation, and we can come back to that. But I, I do think that's an important question. I'd be happy to grapple with it. Thank you, Dan. So as Dan mentioned, the, the volume that we edited is a contribution to this overall conversation, and one which attempts not only to um, bring to the table the voices of lawyers and judges and activists who have been working on the issue, but also to incorporate through a set of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary strategies the work of social scientists and also of psychologists and also of social workers who have been directly engaged with the populations that um, Dr. Johnson has been talking about, but particularly vis-a-vis -vis the issues that uh, Professor Canstrom has mentioned. The volume also represents an effort on the part of the Center for Human Rights and International Justice to embody in some ways its 10-year commitment to develop a new generation of action researchers and human rights activists. For those of you not familiar with the center, the center began 10 years ago with the hope of nurturing a new generation of scholars and practitioners in the United States and abroad who could draw on some of the many strengths of their disciplines but also to engage in rigorous ethical training in the attainment of human rights and international justice. The hope of the center would, was to explore what interdisciplinary scholarship might look like. So in the first year of our seminar, we assigned all of the students there to do an interdisciplinary project. And it was then that Dan and I realized the great um, complexities of what we were asking students to do and the lack of interdisciplinary work on the parts of many of us here at the university. So we partnered with a number of organizations in the greater Boston area who focused in uh, then, and they do now, on issues of migration, detention, and deportation. Dan coined a wonderful phrase, we thought, to first name the project. We called it the Ruby Slippers Project. It was a reference to Dorothy and her shoes. But when we went into the Cambodian community in Lowell, they thought we were communists who were coming to echo some of their earlier concerns and what had led them here to the United States. And the title didn't quite catch on. So we then turned to calling it the Post-Deportation Human Rights Project. And within a year, the migrants that we had partnered with pointed out to us that despite the fact that they were unauthorized here in the greater Boston area, they hadn't yet been deported. So could we please shift the title once again and we've now landed on the Migration and Human Rights Project. So the book um, was an effort to try and not only talk about some of that work from the perspective of the Center for Human Rights and International Justice, but also to bring together a group of scholars nationally who have been thinking about and writing about and working on these issues with activists who have been in their local communities responding to them. The work of the center is captured in chapter seven of the edited volume, which talks about participatory action research with transnational and mixed status families in the post 9-11 threats, both here in the United States and in Guatemala. And is co-authored by four psychologists and also by a uh, then law student who is now an attorney who's worked a lot with youth who have crossed the deserts into the United States. Many of the colleagues and collaborators with whom we worked in the greater Boston area were affiliated with Centro Presente, which then was a migrant organization in Cambridge and then Somerville and now in East Boston, and the Organización Maikiche in New Bedford, which was one of the organizations that was directly involved in the Bianco Leather Goods Factory raid in March of 2007. And it was that raid that in some ways radicalized the project and pushed us to further explore with migrants from Guatemala, many of whom were picked up in that raid 
many mothers separated from their children, many Maya Quiche who did not speak Spanish who were asked to sign documents um, voluntarily withdrawing themselves from the country, that we began to explore in more depth and more collaboratively with local communities the multiple significances for people of detention and deportation and how those experiences echoed earlier experiences in their countries of origin when bombings were ha happening over their villages in the armed conflict in El Salvador or in Guatemala. The volume also brings together the work of psychologists who have worked as clinicians in the deportation and detention cases for many migrants in the United States. Kalina Brabeck, Catherine Porterfield, and Marianne Lockery have all worked with survivors of armed conflict and war zones and have turned their attention more recently to migrants and refugees here in the United States. Dr. Lockery has also been a research psychologist who has worked with international teams that have developed guidelines and norms for community-based interventions in many countries of the world, including her home country of Australia. The chapter is informed by the global context, but focuses most particularly on how mental health professionals can collaborate with lawyers and others in the defense of the rights of refugees and migrants. That work is taken up in a very interdisciplinary focus by Jessica Kiko and Elaine Congress. Jessica was the attorney with our project for many years, and Elaine is a social worker who, works, who teaches at Fordham University, where she's also an administrator. That volume discusses specifically what do we mean when we talk about interdisciplinary work and how can social workers and lawyers collaborate and what's the difference between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary work. The latter being an effort to work side by side but to sustain your work within your own discipline and the former being an effort to begin to try and explore the possibilities of actually standing under each other's knowledge systems and beginning to think about a third way of generating knowledge that might respond more directly to the lived experiences of the migrants themselves. So in each of these efforts, there's been a focus to try and listen to the narratives and hear from people's own lives and not subsume these narratives in the professional practice that we have become such experts at in our university um, lives. The book takes a lot of um, energy from the preface, the introduction, which was done by Luis Argueta, a Guatemalan filmmaker, and he brings images and voices to the work in a very particular way. Of great interest to me was his uh, lack of knowledge about detention and deportation, despite his own journey as a migrant from Guatemala. Luis is a um, much respected and men, much honored filmmaker from Guatemala, and it was only when another raid took place in the United States in Postville, Iowa, and when an article appeared in the New York Times, on the front page of the New York Times, an article by the interpreter who had been hired to interpret for many of the people arrested in Iowa, in which he read about the sort of mass movements of people through the uh, massive detention and deportation system that Dan described briefly to you. And it was then that he decided to take his camera and to move to Iowa for what he hoped was a two-week journey, which turned into a multiple-year trilogy. Luis worked with us during um, the early days of our project and um, collaborated with us on this book and talks about not only the experiences of people here in the United States, but he journeyed with a group of second-generation Guatemalans back to their parents' country of origin, where they met their grandparents for the first time, a journey which is represented in his second film in this trilogy, Abrazos. The f uh, final contributions to the book are about another dimension of the effect of detention and deportation, and that is, in the words of its authors, Katie Dingaman Serda and Ruben Rumbo, the alienation of the new American diaspora in the Salvadoran society. Their chapter focuses on many young men who have been deported back to their parents' country of origin, a country that many of them left when they were very young children, some of whom were even born here in the United States, but have been picked up for a variety of different reasons and sent back to El Salvador. These careful analyses of stories are told by participants and peel away layers of discourse and overgeneralizations to describe the daily struggles of those separated from a world that they have known since infancy 
or early childhood and thrown into a linguistic community of which they are not, in, not familiar. Thus, I think this volume contributes importantly to how we think about transnational challenges facing the U.S and some of the many countries in which the U.S. has been enmeshed politically and economically over multiple lifetimes. Our colonial and racist policies and practices have benefited a small elite while violently disenfranchising a majority population, many of whom now seek relief in this country. Today, we and those in El Salvador, particularly at the Jesuit University there, commemorate the lives and work of six Jesuit priests assassinated 26 years ago on November the 16th. One of them was Ignacio Martín Barro, a Salvadoran social psychologist, a colleague of some here, who challenged us in three important ways that I think the volume represents. The first was to look at action and ideology, that is to try and put the individual and in society where they are, that is, as mutually and dialectically constitutive of human action. Actions that are shaped by and shaping of social forces in particular historical moments. The second focuses on one particular reading of the history of social psychology, one that stresses the importance of social constructivism, that is, of creating stories collaboratively with those who have been most oppressed by these social forces. And finally, the focus on circulations of power, that is, the importance of identifying and critiquing the social interests underlying our disciplines and an insistence that those of us in the academy who don't take a stand on social issues and problems that are affecting lives of all of those around us are people who, in one way or another, sustain the status quo and those who benefit from those systems. So I think both of these books join in trying to make explicit these relationships and, in the words of Martin Barreau, to create a new person and to create a new society. We invite you to join us in conversations about the books and hopefully to read them if you haven't already. And we'll begin that conversation by addressing some questions to each other. Thank you. Well, I will try and keep this brief so we'll have more time for discussion. Um, but in general, I thought this um, uh, the New Deportations Delirium was um, a really thoughtful and provocative collection of essays um, looking at both the legal and the human dimensions of deportation in the U.S., which has grown to a massive proportion in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. And while I know a lot about um, immigration in Boston and Massachusetts, I learned a great deal about the extremely complicated legal uh, regime of deportation and the equally complicated and devastating human costs of uh, that regime. Um, I think the interdisciplinary sweep of the collection is um, really admirable and helps make connections that might otherwise um, be missed. And um, it, it, it actually answered some questions for me in my own work as I wrote about politics, immigrant politics in Boston, and I saw this evolution over time away from a more 1960s, 1970s style uh, ethnic politics, which was about community building and bilingualism and th those types of efforts towards something that was by beginning in the late 1980s and especially in the 90s was much more about um, uh, immigrant rights and human rights. And um, I, I knew that that had a lot to do with uh, various legislation that was passed in the 1980s and 90s. Um, but this collection really helped me to understand uh, just how um, complicated and out of sync um, a lot of that legislation was and how difficult it made it, um, the lives of, of immigrants who were affected by it. Um, in the first half of the book, um, I, I, I thought it was great the way uh, it showed how immigration courts exist in a kind of uh, parallel universe, if you will, um, with, within the Justice Department and the Department of Homeland Security, and the lack of balance and coordination uh, between those two entities. And con with Congress pressing for more and more funding and personnel for immigration enforcement, um, and for the uh, ICE and the Border Patrol in particular, it had the effect of overwhelming the legal system with all these people who were being swept up uh, and, and funneled toward deportation. And it, it meant that there was overcrowding of facilities, abusive practices that violate human rights, and result in um, sometimes irreversible fast-track deportations 
that destroy families and in many cases ignore the, the rule of law. Um, I was also struck by how um, ill-equipped the immigration courts are in terms of adjudicating um, certain um, uh, issues in family and criminal law. And in the process, um, well-established legal principles such as considering the best interest of the child, um, distinguishing between uh, misdemeanors and aggravated felonies um, are really uh, often get lost in the rush to move people back across the border as, as quickly as possible. It was really a, a fascinating account. And the second half of the book um, I found equally compelling, the human drama of the story um, and the, the ways that these, these same policies um, uh, affect families and um, affect individuals and their lives uh, in the countries to which they've been, been deported. And, and the ways in which lawyers and social scientists and immigrants themselves collaborate through this participatory um, uh, um, action research, I think is a really fascinating methodology. And I would love to hear more about how you get that through the IRB, uh, <laughs> which seems might be a nightmare. But <laughs> um, it's, I think it's 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 a it's a wonderful model, though. Um, uh, the, the collaborative and transnational um, research helps to really center the concerns of migrants themselves rather than the concerns that we academics may think are, are central. And um, particularly these descriptions of family separations and the crushing debt that many immigrants uh, face either in this country or in their uh, countries of origin, the psychological trauma that's happening and being experienced twice over, the second war as it were, the second trauma as, as it were. Um, and I, I think um, I, I, I gained a lot from, from reading this. Ultimately, the new um, deportations delirium illustrates how profoundly broken our immigration system has become and how our inaction is making it worse uh, day by day. As the system becomes more cumbersome and more imbalanced, its power to devastate migrants' lives has become greater than ever before. And in the absence of comprehensive immigration reform, however, um, their book offers some, some good insights into how we can make the system more humane in the meantime if we're willing to listen to the voices of, of migrants and, and their concerns. Well, you Thank you. That somewhere, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our first review. <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't questions. You didn't say questions. <laughs> All right. Well, like your book, too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'll start and then Dan. So um, first and foremost, I want to join those. His comments are included on the cover of Lynn's volume. And thank you, Lynn, for this important contribution of pulling together from a wide range of bits and pieces and documentation the history of immigration in the greater Boston area. As a longtime resident of Boston and Cambridge, and someone who has worked as an activist and also as a scholar with many Central Americans, it was really um, a review and a new set of insights about a period in which I lived in this city for many of the um, moments that you were describing, but it exposed me to some of the things that I was not aware of at the time, and also to the breadth and scope of what migrants have contributed to Boston. And particularly for me, I thought that the juxtaposition of local and national politics facilitated the access and then the limitations of immigrants and their potential and realized and not always realized successes here in the greater Boston area. It seemed to me that you captured some of the ways in which US policy around where people are from um, has a huge influence on what opportunities people have when they arrive here. So in the example of Cubans who received open arms and then later Central Americans who have been sent back repeatedly at the border. Um, and that those decisions reflect national and international policies on the part of the United States. <coughs> and I think that's something that sometimes gets lost in the story about migration and particularly the focus of the myth we have about this country. So for me, your way of tracing for us some of the conditions that gave rise to what you described so effectively at the end of the book, this chasm that exists in the migrant population, the same chasm that exists in the broader population, mm -hmm. and the challenges that we face um, to try and um, redress those inequalities and inequities. 
I also found the ways in which you trace the multiple strategies of some of the ethnically and linguistically and racially diverse migrant communities that have been used to resist marginalization, to fight for their rights, and to press for inclusion in leadership and local and statewide governments to be illuminating. You situate those struggles within the wider conflict around racism in the Boston community, and particularly with the hostility but among and between members of the African American communities and immigrant communities around the busing crisis that characterized so much of the city in 1974 and 75, when the city of Boston was called for mandatory busing in order to comply with the state's Racial Imbalance Act. Although much of this is history that's known to local activists, it's not always known how local Latino and Asian communities responded and also initiated within their own communities, shifts that led to the opportunities for their communities in education and in human services. One of the issues that struck me, I think, more as a community psychologist and one who has been engaged in activist scholarship has to do with the issue of the relationship between organizing and service deliveries. Mm -hmm. So my own profession was deeply marked by John Kennedy's signing of the Community Mental Health Act in 1963, which many argue actually gave rise to community psychology as a subdiscipline within psychology, both informed by that action, but also informed by the lack of funding for the deinstitutionalization of mental health patients. And that then was deeply informed by African American activism, black activism in the cities, particularly in New England, and we trace the history in the United States, at least of community psychology, to Swampscott, Massachusetts. So there was an interesting mm. folding in of that um, history. So your analysis for me was sobering and juxtaposing community organizing of those days with an understanding of immigrant rights, which parallels for me some of what I was involved in with the domestic violence issue. And that sort of yeah. takes me to a first question that I have for you. Um, and that has to do with what you might see or how you might add to some of your argument about the relationship or the transitions from community-based organizing and the service delivery systems of professionals and how, in many ways, um, the organizing dimensions of Latinos and of Asian Americans or of women in the domestic violence movement were responded to by professionals who offered the much needed services to these communities. But professionals then, in many ways, took over mm -hmm. some of these movements. And as the movements became professionalized, some of the contestational dimensions of the movements, I think, were drawn out of them or seeped out of them or was submerged. Um, and that's a story that actually you pointed out in your comments about our book that is a struggle that we have right now with accompanying community organizing around detention and deportation issues. That is, how do we focus the voices of protagonists while providing much needed resources and not swallow those voices in some way? So I wondered whether you had any thoughts about sort of that juxtaposition um, and what ways, if any ways, um, the sort of critique has been sort of drawn out of some of that organizing. Um, secondly, you situate today's ethnically, linguistically, and racially diverse migrant community within a 20th century community organizing that Asian Americans and Latinos were involved in, and to a lesser extent, the Portuguese speaking and the Haitian communities. And that organizing has been one that seeks inclusion over transformation more recently has looked to electoral politics when previously they took their messages to the streets. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether you see these stories in any way as, on the one hand, having matured, that's my word, not yours, um, <laughs> but also that some of the electoral successes, which are the result of coalition building among and between migrant groups, but may also cost these groups something in terms of their own organizing efforts. So on the one hand, I would agree with you that Walsh has heated pressures from a range of migrant groups and diversified some of his own political appointments. As significantly, you described Mira and Central Presente as having done incredible advocacy mm -hmm. to push for the rights of migrants and to push for voter registration. But 
is that at some political cost, and what, if anything, has been given up in this process? Another example that, for me, is notable is one that you talk about, on the one hand, in the book when you describe the Asian American push, not just in terms of the images you gave, which are great, of Chinatown, but also in establishing a public school system in Chinatown, mm -hmm. in which yeah. bilingual education was a core piece of that educational experience. And yet, in 2002, the state of Massachusetts voted out bilingual education, much um, influenced by, I would argue, the financial resources of a Californian who had pushed for the same um, change in California and in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And research by many of my colleagues here at the Lynch School has demonstrated the enormous cost to immigrant communities of the absence of bilingual education and of the new system that's sort of taken root in our public school system. So the second question then has to do with sort of another set of examples that at least raise questions about where are we today in, in, in resisting some of these moves and have we paid a cost in mm -hmm. some way for moving into the electoral um, system. So I really appreciate the lessons learned from the historical contextualization of many of these issues and wonder if, as we talk, you can comment on whether or not you see any downsides, particularly in a moment when we've reached, as you described it, a majority minority population here in New England. Let me just add one, one more thing, and I'll be really brief. Um, I mean, I, I agree that the book is, is very important and enlightening and interesting, particularly for those of us who have been here for a while. The city has changed in ways that were unimaginable, I think. I remember first coming here, and I, I was raised in an interracial family, and I have a brother who doesn't look like me. And we just took it for granted that we couldn't go take him to eat in the North End. I mean, it just, we just, that was just assumed that that was likely to have trouble. I remember that we're Southie, you know, I mean, you just wouldn't think of it. So the change has been really dramatic. I, I find myself wondering about the immigrant story here in Boston. What I liked about the book is that we really need more of these local, you know, high, deep analysis, deep understanding of how immigration has worked. And I think that's a style of scholarship that was popular, you know, 80, 90 years ago. We've had less of it since then. But to the extent that I have read some of that, it strikes me that, that Boston really is quite unique in the way it's responded to this deportation delirium and some of the characteristics of the immigrant flow. We have fewer undocumented people, more well-educated, more high-tech. I mean, it's been a, you, you document that. Yeah. I think a lot of the positive has come from that, even though, of course, you're right about the, the need for child care. And I used to say, you know, go in the back of any restaurant in Boston and you find undocumented immigrants washing dishes. And I used to represent all those people. I mean, that, that was my life you were talking about when they were starting Central Presente. Um, for those communities, though, is there has been, I think there still is a pervasive feeling of being under threat of deportation. I think that's been a really powerful psychological reality and an and a empirical reality for a lot of them. Um, and yet, they were maybe a little less affected by it in, than people in other parts of the country. And in my experience, Ted Kennedy had a lot to do with that, frankly, and his office in representing people and helping intercede with INS in getting some of those appointments to be people who are a little more compassionate and humane than the ones who got appointed in Texas or Louisiana. You know, so there's an interesting cultural relationship between this the sort of liberalism of Boston as it's developed um, and the immigrant community. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, and not only Ted Kennedy, Michael Dukakis too actually, did right. mm -hmm. a lot of important things in terms of public benefits being available to non-citizens. You know, there are a variety of initiatives in that administration too. And it's pretty timely as we now have a governor who is, you know, <laughs> immediately jumping on the fear bandwagon and saying, you know, we don't need any stinking Syrians here because we're all afraid of them. Sorry, that was a little strong, but I'm, I'm not happy with our current governor. Anyway, I'll leave it to you. Okay, Take great. Issue, well, <laughs> a lot of big issues there. <laughs> Um, but ones I think you're you're both right on target about. Um, certainly to start with the you know the Ted Kennedy question um, first. Um, Boston has always had a reputation as being, or not always, but for for much of its history, it's been known to be an immigrant friendly city and and state. And this has particularly been been true you know since since the 1960s. Um, and I think some of that has to do with it being, uh, you know, being an immigrant portal throughout its, its history. 
And although there have been strong currents of restrictionism that came from Brahmins in the, the, the late 19th and early 20th century, there was also a strong uh, liberal, often Catholic, um, input into local politics that was friendly toward immigrants and refugees. And Boston's one of the few cities in the country that actually didn't, um, the restriction period here between the 20s and the 60s, it continued to, to take in uh, many immigrants uh, and uh, refugees as, as well as immigrants when many other places were getting very few. Um, so I do think that's been very important and I, I found that a number of the um, immigration, uh, constructive immigration legislation that was trying to deal with on the ground problems, particularly in the 1980s and 90s, um, was coming out of the office of um, Ted Kennedy or Joe Mowgli and others, and you can actually trace local issues. The, the famous was the 1990 lottery, which <laughs> having to do with the various immigrant groups, and no, notably some of the newer Irish immigration being, you know, unable to get in under the, the new system of needing a lottery to bring. And the irony of that is it was really African immigrants who, who capitalized on that uh, even more so than, uh, than the Irish who were more uh, short term. Um, so I, all of that definitely um, matters. And um, to go back to the um, Brenton's point about um, community politics and um, the costs involved in, in, in shifting to a more mainstream political system, as we've seen people from uh, many different immigrant groups, and particularly the, the second generation now that's come of age and, and are citizens and who are running for office and, and being elected, which I think is, is, is a great development, but it does come with some costs in terms of um, the more radical stance of some of the community organizations that were able to really um, fight for uh, very important issues without feeling they were beholden to other political interests in their, in their district. Um, but I, I also think that immigrants are not alone in, in this, in that um, particularly what's happened with the nonprofit sector in the country generally. Um, there's been a shift in, in politics under neoliberalism, right? And that the, the community-based politics, street politics, protest politics of the 1960s and 70s um, just um, is not able to uh, function as effect effectively as it used to. And it has a lot to do with the changing um, structure of you know funding for community-based organizations, um, which are the ones I've worked for. I've in just the few years that I, I have uh, in the last ten years or so, I've seen a real shift from organizations that I like to work for because they were doing really important things and they were really focused on empowerment and empowering youth. And um, increasingly, as their funders uh, objected to that. They move toward you know less controversial uh, activities and just you know teaching English and teaching citizenship class you know running citizenship classes and that kind of thing and not wanting to rock the boat. So I think um, it's it hasn't necessarily been a choice that immigrants have made. I think they did choose to fight you know to shift toward immigrant rights because that was absolutely essential in their day to day lives. But in terms of community politics, um, I think it's it's been dictated by some larger larger forces. There are a few groups, including Centro Presente, that have tried to resist that and to, to maintain themselves as a membership organization that would be controlled more by its members than by its funders. Um, but I think it's financially very, very difficult to do that. So a lot of groups have shifted in the, the, the path of, of least resistance as a means of survival. Um, but I, I would love to hear other questions yes. on both books. <laughs> well, let's open it up. <laughs> Comments? This is a question of uh, information. You mentioned that uh, uh, a certain person who was born in the United States was deported. No. That's what I heard you say. No, I'm sorry. If I said that, it's not because true. You can't deport the citizen. That's true. You cannot. I don't think I said that. I think you I said I her said citizenship it. was removed. Oh, oh Emma Emma Goldman. Goldman. So she no, was it wasn't no. it was, it was about some other no, there are people who have been raised in the United States. If I said it in this book, I'm sorry. There are people who come here as young children mm -hmm. and who are F, you know, uh, right. uh, culturally, culturally American, linguistically American. If I said born on this book, I'm sorry. There are, there's a small num number of actually U.S. citizens who have been deported by the state. That has happened, uh, but that's a different story. But you know, basically you can't deport a U.S. citizen. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Dan, I was struck by your point um, about there being a parallel uptick 
with uh, deportations and then also mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. And but I want you to talk a little bit more about that. And I was also wondering, we were thinking about what we know now, you know, the, the, the role of, um, of, kind of the privatization of, of punishment in, in, in terms of mass incarceration and, and the collaboration of American Legislative Exchange Council and uh, Corrections Corporations of America and really pushing a lot of this zero, uh, zero tolerance policies um, that led to a lot of this uh, mass incarceration. And I was just on Friday, I was listening to uh, NPR report about ICE and their outsourcing. Uh -huh. uh, and then so I'm just wondering about the, the, the role of the privatization of detention and yeah. deportation. Is, is, is that beginning to play a little real outsized role in the same way that privatization played in, in Mark Massey? Yeah, Massey. it's a big story, actually. And um, I've been to a number of conferences that have talked a lot about this. There's also some of the people who work for ICE have kind of worked for some of the, there's, there's beginning to be a bit of a revolving door there. And there's big money in this, the CCA, the Corrections Corporation of America. Um, about the first thing I, I will say, I actually hadn't thought about this, and I, and I should have, until Mary Waters, who teaches sociology at Harvard, came and commented on my last book. And she was the one who actually had these trend lines that were almost exactly parallel. The trend line of deportations going up from the 70s to the 80s, mass incarceration, and felony disenfranchisement. And of course, felony disenfranchisement, in a way, can be understood as a way of transforming citizens back into aliens, because you take away the vote, which is the you know one of the main differentiation lines between being a citizen and not being a citizen. So that's a very interesting phenomenon. But I think that the rise in deportation was very much tied to the increase in the criminal justice system, particularly because a lot of the deportees are people who have run, you know, run afoul of the criminal justice system. And so all of the racialized aspects of the criminal justice system play themselves out in deportation as well. It's just an added sanction. They, they will serve their time, do whatever penalty there is, and then if they happen to be Cape Verdean or, you know, any uh, Haitian, you know, then they, they, in addition to that, get deported at the end of the day, often for very minor offenses. So I've always felt that these things need to be understood in parallel and that the racial aspects of these systems is not an accident or an artifact. Now, I'm not saying that anybody was intentionally racist or consciously trying to depopulate the country in the way that Thomas Jefferson, for example, proposed for years, you know, a colonization program. But I still think that the, our ability to accept this as sort of natural is very much related to the targets of it. If it, if it, if it were young white immigrants, particularly of middle class families who were, who were so, suddenly at the age of 19 being ripped away from their families because of a single drug offense, I think you would hear a much larger outcry than we've heard in this country about that system. As for the privatization, it's also true that the the law has in it a 30,000 bed mandate right. that the agency has to fulfill. They, they actually have to use those beds according to the statute. And so the private sector has jumped in to fill that void. So you're now having a very toxic mix of profit and cracking down on crime. Now, of course, we're witnessing a sort of change in the attitude about the criminal justice system. And in this administration, at least something of a change about deportation, although not much and not nearly as much as we had hoped. So, but the numbers are somewhat down, but they're still pretty strong. You know, I, I have the, the concern that in the next administration, which I think is less likely to be Sanders than I would like, that we're going to see a tremendous uptick in deportation again. And this gets back to the basic idea that what we have, in the, and this is partially in response to your question as well, this country has become enormously open to people coming in legally and illegally. And we've had very large numbers of people who have come in. And deportation is the mechanism that catches that phenomenon and corrects it. it corrects, you know, as a euphemism or in quotation marks. So in a way, you can understand the relationship between the two things, as you have a very relatively open system, legally in terms of families, but then you have young people growing up, many of whom, particularly as Brenda was saying, the Cambodian community never knew how to naturalize. Were never told by their parents that there was any difference between having a green card or being admitted as a refugee and being a citizen. And then when they were 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and they got caught with some, again, typically drug crimes, but various other things, the first time they learned that there was a difference was when they found themselves being deported. So that's also a part of the story. I hope that answered. That was a lot of a long way today. <laughs> yes. Besides with the current election cycle and the discussion on 
configuration, especially with Donald Trump. Um, who? Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that um, deportation policy is more of an implicit or tacit discussion in politics, um, as opposed to, for example, Australia, where stop the boats and the slogan is actually more of a policy that's driven by the electorate themselves, and actually incarceration of the asylum seekers has been pretty much a very clear and open policy, you know, putting them in detention centers in Papua New Guinea, and et cetera. I find that in the United States, it's not really discussed as much. It's not a political issue. I guess, I don't know if I'm you know, misspeaking there, but do you find that there's an actual difference between the way that the deportation policy is discussed in the United States? Well, I'll just say briefly, I mean, Trump, I, I, was it Marx who said history repeats itself first as tragedy, then as farce? <laughs> I think now we're in the farce phase of this. Even Trump says, yeah, I'm gonna deport 11 million of them, and that'll be great, and then I'm gonna let most of them back in, because most of them are decent people anyway. That's what he says now. I mean, that's so absurd that you don't even know where to begin, but it's, it's like the last gasp of trying to vindicate this idea that deportation is somehow a legitimate policy. It's very peculiar. And people really do conflate the deportation of the undocumented with the deportation of the lawful permanent residents convicted of crimes, which I think we, we need to disaggregate. Um, I, I've never heard a more incoherent public debate than we're having right now about deportation. I don't know what anybody's position really means among the major candidates. Um, I thought I knew what Barack Obama's position was in 2007, but I've been disabused of that notion. But I, 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 just to add to that though, I think the, the sort of fixation on the wall between yeah. Mexico and the United States and the sort and of militarization of that area of the United States, which I think being in New England, it, it's, yeah, yeah it, you lose track of that discussion and, and, and also of the n enormous number of people who have died in the desert and who are being killed um, and deeply having no rights. Um, and the push, you know, the collaborations with Mexico that have pushed the border between Guatemala, for example, and Mexico to be the site of um, ongoing. So I think those issues, there is a sort of odd politicization of those issues and, a, and a, um, a very strong, and even this discourse of building a wall between Canada and the United States, which, um, and then uh, as Dan alluded a few minutes ago, I do think the Syrian issue is going to catapult this discussion into very untasteful. Um, well, this thing about Mexico is really important to understand while we're on the subject. Uh, I mean, I spent my life criticizing the harshness of the U.S. deportation system, but a model where we then pay off the Mexican police to interdict Guatemala and children and send them back, you know, that's, that's worse. I mean, if anything, that's worse, and it requires a globalized critique of these sorts of practices and who's paying for them. And that's another form of outsourcing. I don't think it's privatized yet, but it's another example of that. I can't remember the author of the piece in the first half of the book who taught, talked about this disequilibrium between U.S. Um, immigration policy, and particularly, you know, this emphasis on building the wall, securing the border. We just hear it over and over again, and how more money, and more money has to go, even though the border patrol doesn't even need it or particularly want it. But you just keep putting money into enforcement, and it just drives this whole deportations delirium, right? Um, and it's, it's a very narrow way of, of understanding the problem and not um, one hand not understanding what the other is doing and creating a problem that's worse than it would have been if you hadn't done anything. <laughs> this problem has been brought to the BC campus in a funny way, even though we're so distant, because uh, a student, I hope I have the story right, put up a wall in the dorm and said, keep America great. Let's what make America great again. Let's build a wall. Yeah, keep America, build a wall. And uh, I have a student in my class who's from LA. Uh, you know, and you could see the geographical or emotional distances between people because people in the class kind of heard that. He was so upset, his hand was shaking. I don't know if you noticed that. In other words, the crim on campus feeling this, yeah, keep them out, even though. 200 to 300 people die a year in the desert. But, you know, it's something to be aware of, how serious this is. This does come, my point being, it comes to the BC campus in this type of form, and maybe we don't take it that seriously because we live so far 
Thank you. You have a question? Well, I'm, I'm neither a scholar nor an academic, but as a citizen, uh, could you help me understand the lowest common denominator, the nature of this deportation crisis? Because I'd just like to respond to it in the best way that I can. Well, in a nutshell, um, in all of human history, there has never been a system anywhere near the size and scope of the U.S. deportation system. It is a massive social experiment. So that's number one. The numbers, we've never seen anything even remotely similar to it. Where we're in formal proceedings, we've been deporting about 400,000 people per year, tens of thousands of whom are lawful permanent residents of the United States. Uh, the fact that most people don't know about this is another interesting question mm -hmm. because in the, among the communities who are affected by it, they know about it and they're acutely aware of it. But for those of us who don't experience it personally, we're often unaware of it. So that's number one. Number two is the system is anomalous legally, which is to say that it's a peculiar system. The people who are facing deportation don't have a lot of the rights that, for example, a criminal defendant would have. They don't have the right to a lawyer. They don't have the right to bail, you know, various things like that. So from my perspective, it works a sort of corroding influence on our better understandings of the, the rule of law and the way the rule of law should operate. And to that end, the other thing is that substantively, it's very harsh by, internet, by any international measure. So for example, if a person is facing deportation in Europe under the system that exists there, the judge must take into account the gravity of the person's offense on the one hand, but also whether they have family here in there, you know, whether they have children, whether they have a spouse, how long they've lived here. They have to look at the totality of the record, and then they have to balance those two things and decide if deportation is just. It's also true that if a person is going to be deported for crime, basically that in most of, of, of Europe, that would be considered to be double punishment. We don't send a person to jail and then deport them too. You could do one or the other. So there's a lot of things like that. Our system is peculiar, and part of the reason I wrote the first book was to grapple with the question of how did it get that way? Where did it come from? And you know, I can talk more about that if you want, but that would be a longer talk. But I think those are the main aspects of it, that it's a, it's a really huge system of which people are unaware, that it's an anomalous system that is different from the rest of our legal processes. I mean, you have more rights if you apply for Social Security than you do if you're facing deportation. The judges in this book said, it's as if we were adjudicating death penalty cases in a traffic court. That's the way it works. Those are judges who said that. And the third is that substantively, it's, it's very harsh. So families are being routinely separated. A lot of elderly Cambodian parents have been left alone in Lowell because their only child was deported back to Cambodia after living here for 19 years after being carried from the killing fields. So they're lawful legal residents but not citizens. Right. You can have a green card in this country for 50 years. There's no rule that you have to become a citizen. Actually, it's relatively easier to become a citizen in this country than in many others, but it's not that easy particularly for an elderly Cambodian woman who may not speak English and may not even know to tell her son, you should do this. You know, so it does cost a non-trivial amount of money to do it, but if people, it would have, it's a tragedy that many of them did. You know, that's true. Just a comment on the two different books, is that okay? Absolutely. They tell very different kinds of stories. Yeah. I mean, that uh, immigrants are so victimized by the state doesn't mean that there isn't this story of reshaping mm -hmm. cities. Right, right. That's what's and, and, and you don't want to make it sound, you know, you don't want to tell a story just about victims. And I, it's very important what Lynn does because she's telling a story about how people do make it. And I don't think her book is, a, is letting off the state off the hook. I think it's, it's not about that. And I, the, the, because we can, it's so easy because, you know, it's so terrible what's going on. I mean, it's so terrible. But it's very easy to, to lose the other story that people do make lives here with and without documents. And many of them want, you know, they, that's, that's a fact. And it's important to know that. And it's, it's I think my book is meant to be, um, you know, a clear criticism yeah. of oh, no, this whole edifice of, uh, yeah. of immigration law and deportation law that's 
that's yeah. emerged in no, it does it's justified right. it's supposed yeah. it's justified by, you know, the bad behavior of immigrants, which is, you know, complete hogwash. I mean, if you right. look at how important immigrants right. are in any given city, um, but particularly a place like Boston where, you know, our population and our labor force is absolutely, you know, they're absolutely essential to it. Yeah, you know, I, I mean this is why I was looking forward to this evening because yeah. I, I agree with you completely. Yeah, the right. idea is to hold these both ideas. Absolutely. In your brain. For example, if we were having this conversation in France, it would be a much different sort of conversation. If you, because there you have large populations who have never really been fully integrated into the society, and I think there have been some terrible consequences of that. But I also think our book is not about victims either. I mean, it's about a repressive system, but it particularly tries to situate the ways in which people have constructed their own resistance to this repressive sure. system. Absolutely. And so I think it's, it's a, but it is a different angle on the um, very intimately interconnected issues. Right. Um, just a comment. I think another issue that relates to like what both of your books have discussed but um, has not really been discussed yet is like the issue um, of immigrants being able to retain their own identity while still assimilating into um, U.S. culture because I think um, a lot of times, especially with uh, immigrant families that I've gotten to know, they feel this like tremendous pressure to drop everything that's culturally relevant to them and essentially like reinvent themselves along this American mold. And I just think it's really important to like also include this discussion like while immigrants can succeed in the United States, it should not be fully contingent on the fact that they become fully like Americanized, but they also can can capitalize on the strengths of their own culture and use that as a way to succeed as well. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point because I think that that in both books, what you see is there is a shift, I think, in the politics of inclusion or the politics of resistance from the point of view of identities. And I mean, I think. It, it, certainly in Lynn's book, the discussions about the Asian American community, the discussions about the Latino community, are all about people planting their feet and saying, this is who we are, and this is how we want to do what we think we want to do in this community where we live. And, and, and some of the questions I was raising actually are about sort of in this neoliberal climate, where there is a growing influence on certain ways of doing things, which have to do with nonprofits, which have to do with um, entering the political system as the system exists, are we not losing some of that resistance mm -hmm. to maintain? And which I think actually is about how do we transform this system so that it reflects who we have become as a country, which is. I think not the same country we were yeah. 150 yeah. years ago. And that's, I think, where some of the, the struggle um, and some of the issues about, I mean, I, you know, and I think these are issues are related to um, the questions that were raised about incarceration and the capacity or the incapacity of us in the United States to look at systemic and institutional issues of racism and how they constrain some of what anybody in this country can can do. Even here. Yeah. But can I, you know, one of the tra just to get back to that question, the tragedy of the deportees for me, uh, when I went to the Azores to interview deportees, for example, I interviewed a dozen men in, in the Azores about their deportation experiences. I felt like that I could have been in Somerville, you know, and then I realized I basically am in Somerville because all of these guys grew up in Somerville and they still have Boston accents and they're wearing Red Sox caps. And they had so fully assimilated that then, when they woke up one morning and got deported, they didn't know they don't, you know they didn't know how, none of them speak Portuguese. They don't know how to make their way in Europe. They don't know anything. They're Americans. And I, I do think there's a really big difference too in, in looking at because the first chapter of my book is about the old immigrants in Boston going from the the Irish through um, you know the new immigrant groups in the early 20th century and the the differences the difference that the civil rights movement makes in terms of you know, um, being more accepting of cultural differences and, and ethnic and racial differences and, and, and getting away from the idea that you, you have to assimilate and that's how you become American. There are different ways of, of different paths for doing that. And, but the racial issue, I think, is still, has still been a big challenge because you can, 
um, you know, if you come from, from Africa or Latin America or Asia, and you can sit, you might say, you, you know, you want to, you're going to be as American as possible, and you're not going to speak your native language, and you're going to give up your old cultural ways, but you're still perceived as an outsider, um, but because for, for racial reasons, um, that continues to be, that continues to be a problem. But I do think it's, it, it's come a long way from, from the old model of assimilation, which has been in some ways discredited. Is there a final question or comment? Yeah, one more. Yes. One more. As we look ahead in the next 10, 15 years, what can we anticipate? What pressures will come to bear that will change things? <laughs> but I ask Gustavo Gutierrez a question about the next 10 years. He took refuge in hope. <laughs> what, um, what, you know, I don't know the answer to your question at all, but I do think that there is an extraordinary paralysis in this country around comprehensive immigration reform, and one could attribute that paralysis to the paralysis in Congress. Um, but I think it has roots in many other things in addition to that. Um, partly, I think, the lack of awareness of this detention and deportation system. That is, it, it, we haven't succeeded in sort of calling that to the attention of the wider public. And this conversation makes me wonder to what extent um, that has to do with some of the success story that Lynn has shared with us, that is that in Boston locally, I'm not talking about nationally, um, but it seems to me we have to um, do something about that, and that has to be a piece of what the next 10 years are going to be about if we really are going, we have to break this system in which we continue to militarize our borders and throw people out at the rate that we're... Yeah, I guess yeah, I'm just asking, I, was, I wanted to be a little bit more hopeful in it. Yeah, so well, I, I can try a little bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I focus strictly on sort of domestic and, and demographic issues, um, it's, it, it's hard to imagine things continuing to get worse in the long term given that you know, the population is changing. Um, I, you know, we can talk about Donald Trump and the, and the crazy Republican uh, debates, but uh, you know, how, is, how is that gonna fly in, a country, in the future in a country that's becoming more and more you know, non-white as, as a result of immigration and as a result of our native-born white population? Uh, declining, which it's it's doing here, it's doing in a lot of European and, and, and other uh, parts of the the, develop, the, the uh, developed world. So I I think I'd, I'd like to think that that's that's ultimately going to have to make a difference in our politics and the way we handle the immigration question, and that we're going to um, just thinking about you know all of us baby boomers retiring and who's going to who's going to take these jobs and where are we going to I think we're we're going to have to loosen up a little bit on on our, our immigration and deportation policies. Well, let me just say that we're probably this job for my cold dead hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're just this job. But, the, but I was going to say this, I, there's no pathway to the White House that doesn't involve you know Republicans getting a large larger percentage of Latino votes than they've gotten. So, you know, Trump can say whatever he wants, but there's no way to win that. There's no, there's just no, no the electoral policy, electoral numbers don't work. So as far as Latino immigration, but by the way, don't, you know, sorry? We hope. No, no, I, there's no, I'm sure. And it, well, Asian population too. I mean, Asians are growing. Yeah, but population. those populations could become anti-immigrant over time. I mean, you know, the Italian and the Irish are relatively strong in terms of like saying, well, we made it, you know, they have their yeah. own narrative. So each generation develops new narratives, and um, that's part of what I don't like about what this administration has done, is sort of trying to differentiate the good ones from the bad ones, which I think is always a racialized construction. But that's not that you want an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Optimism doesn't run deep in my genes. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming this evening.